Sharon, this was your debut feature film. It would have been really easy to have been intimidated by a big studio. I know you did talk about imposter syndrome in your <laughs> intro, but kind of looking back, what were some of the choices and decisions that you were really proud of? Well, they were all kind of, it was a big risk strategy for both universal and working title movies. I mean, we had, me hadn't directed a, a movie before, a Texan playing an English person. Yeah. Um, and so, I mean, there were lots of, lots of worries about the whole thing. I think as well at the time, I think, I, I always believed in Helen's book. I loved that book. I think it's a work of genius in many ways. And so um, I always felt sure that it would stand up on its own. But I, I think there were lots of people around at the time who didn't know what this movie would be. And I think there was sort of like comments at the time, well, isn't it going to be this something about Mary? Or isn't it going right. to be, you know, and they just didn't know what it would be. So I always believed in her and I always believed in, in the, the situations in the book because they were based on so many specifics. It was based on either her life or people she knew, Helen's life or people she knew. And, and I think the best sort of comedy is based on specifics. Mm. And this was very good because it was not something, it was British women recognized this in the 90s. But then it was universal. So when I spoke to Renee, and um, when she first came to meet, she knew this character, you know. And so I, I think, I think, yeah, there was there was probably a lot of worry. I was trying to shut my ears to it probably <laughs> about what it would be. But I always felt that um, because I was I was a part of the books mm -hmm. as as well because Helen and Tracy and I were very much these women who were in our 30s um, at the time in the, in the nice when we weren't conforming to the idea of, well, actually we couldn't get a man. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we weren't conforming to the conventions of getting married and having babies. Yeah. And we were out there pretty much scared yeah. stiff, really. And, um, you know, swinging in the wind a bit, really. And, you know, saying, well, if you don't, have babies and you don't have um, um you know don't get married in your mid-30s and what is it just your career mm. and or you know what's the meaning of life if you don't do all of those things and um you know it transpired that it was going out and getting trashed and <laughs> not really caring about those things you know so yeah it, but it was it was scary to do the movie mm. i don't think i got much sleep uh, tracy's here actually yeah tracy McLeod. tracy mcleod is there here she, she is. is one of the original the original uh, trio. Stand up, babe. <laughs> <laughs> Where are you? <laughs> How was it for you having your life kind of mined by your friend? Because it was a column initially, and then a book, and then obviously you you end up in the film and yeah. in kind of some sort of amalgamation, right? You know, I, I somebody asked me as well the other day, weren't you, you know, weren't you offended or insulted? To, and I actually wasn't at the time. I don't know what that says about me, but I remember you know, reading all sorts of things about my sexual, awkward sexual experiences in that column and thinking, oh, this is very funny, isn't it? You know, and rather than thinking, oh, you know, yeah. what will my mum think? Well, I knew my mum wouldn't read The Independent anyway, so <laughs> I wasn't that worried. So, um, but yeah, I mean, it, it was probably, I should have been, it should have been more awkward, but it wasn't, you mm. know, so. What about directing Sally Phillips and Shirley Henderson in those roles, which were kind of your, friendship group that yeah. must have been really special were you were you able to give them some sort of insight of where Helen was coming from in her writing yeah I think we were able to do that I mean I pick I'm supposed to be Shazza in the movie but I think Shazza and Jude there's an amalgamation of Tracy and I mm -hmm. you know she mixed it up a bit she was the uh, crying in the toilets one well it was probably me wasn't it <laughs> <laughs> Nodding, nodding. From I don't Tracy. think Tracy ever cried in a toilet <laughs> over, over a man. <laughs> but then I did emotional footage and things like that right. because I was usually the one, you know, drunk and falling down the walls mm -hmm. of of a bar at night. So, um, but yeah, what was the question again? I, was, I can't remember. <laughs> you answered it. Um, there was kind of, as you alluded to, kind of an uproar at the time about the casting of Renee Zellweger. So from your perspective, before you met her, how worried were you about casting a Texan actress? Did you think it was going to work or not really? Um, 
really worried about the accent yeah. because she really did have, she really <laughs> does have a Texas accent. So I thought, God, how are we going to get her to, to that? And it, we did go through some interesting machinations. She had a brilliant voice coach though, mm -hmm. Barbara Berkeley. So, um, she also so did, uh, did she do Gwyneth Paltrow? Yeah, as she's well? done them all, Barbara. Yeah. She's amazing. Um, so, and they had a very close relationship. And so I think that was instrumental in her getting the accent to where it was. Um, but um, she, I had no worries about her. She made me laugh in the room. Mm -hmm. I, Richard Curtis, who was a, is a friend, said, whoever makes you laugh in the room, that's who you should cast. Right. That's a good, you know, that's a good indication. And she made me laugh in the room and she said, you know, she said, oh my God, if we don't get this accent right, we're so busted, aren't we? And I said, yeah, we really are. So she took on the responsibility and she's funny and she's very self-deprecating. And I thought that the character, that's a, that's a very English quality and you don't always get many Americans with that quality, but she understood it. And she, she understood all those awkwardnesses of dating in your thirties and all of that sort of thing. She um, didn't have the big ass, but she did. You know. <laughs> she was happy to get one. All the big knickers. <laughs> um, and you, did you um, come up with the idea of getting her to work in an actual publishing house? Yeah, yeah. Which was inspired. Oh, yeah. Well, I worked in. That's when I first came to London. Um, I worked in a publishing house. I worked in, for Penguin for years, and so um, we just decided to ask Pan Macmillan, who published Bridges. Uh, you know the Bridget book whether they would take her on you know <laughs> and um, we didn't know if she'd agree but she loves all that Renee she loves all the research yeah. of, of all of that and she did she picked up phones uh, she made tea and various people you know in Pan Macmillan would look at her and go will you remind me of somebody you know <laughs> and um, and she would go really oh, yeah. <laughs> and she and she spoke with the accent wow. and you know she picked up pan mcmillan publicity how can i help you <laughs> you know so she did it all and for her it was important as well to try and capture the sort of Ameri um, english sense of humor mm. you know because they're, they're really different senses yeah. of humor you know we, we would the pair of us are oftentimes have had conversations where I go, I don't know what you're talking about. Why is that funny? <laughs> and, and she'll say the same to me. I don't know what you're talking. Why is that funny? So, um, but we, you know, we have enough in common to, and we both love that character mm -hmm. and understood that character that we found a way around it. Mm -hmm. yes. And talking about casting the other roles, did you fancy Colin Firth when you first met him? Oh, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Good God. But I mean, just actually, I forgot to answer that the reason I picked Sha uh, the reason I picked Sally yes. um, to play Shazza was I thought, okay, somebody that's supposedly playing me well, it was a mixture of me and Tracy. I just thought Sally was the funniest woman on TV yeah. at that time. Was she doing Smack the Pony? She was doing Smack the yeah. Pony, and I think she was doing um, Alan Partridge. She was the receptionist in Alan Partridge, and I just thought, oh, I'm going to have her. <laughs> I'm going to have her play supposedly me, you know, and. Um, and she was wonderful, you know, and I, I loved her to bits. Anyway, so who was it? Colin Firth. Yeah, of course I fancied him. <laughs> and, you know, and just couldn't look at him, you know, or <laughs> you, you know, it was just like, oh God, you know, how am I going to? But they're both brilliant yeah. people and they're both, they're, all the cast were incredibly collaborative mm. and were really kind to me as a first time director. You know, they, they knew, you know, they knew that well, they, I suppose they knew what I wanted, which was that we have to find a kernel of truth. We can't just play it for laughs. And, um, and, and they found it each time and they were very, very good with me. You know, I mean, I had an amazing cast, you know, Celia Emery and, you know, um, Gemma Jones and yeah, Jim, Jim, Broadbent. Jim Broadbent, who I'd always, I just thought, oh my God, I'm on a, I'm on a set with Jim Broadbent, who I just loved and thought, <laughs> And you just call him one take Jim. He doesn't <laughs> ever need another really? take. He just does it. He's yeah. just brilliant. So, absolutely. Something else that almost became like a character in its own right was the soundtrack. Yeah. I, you know, every that is one of the most iconic soundtracks, I think, certainly of me growing up. How like involved were you in curating that? Because it, of it, it comes into the actual film as well when she's dancing to Shaka Khan and all of that yeah. kind of stuff so tell me about how you chose those really partic those particular songs well I, the soundtrack is just one of my favorite bits of doing those movies right. because I mean you just get to live out all of these fantasies and 
And I can guarantee you that every single track that I thought of that I would use, mm -hmm. like when we were filming, I'm usually filming with a soundtrack in my head and absolutely never works. When you get into the edit suite, you go, it doesn't work, it doesn't work. And there's a, uh, you know, the poor man who called Nick Angel, who's this, the music supervisor, just driven to distraction <laughs> by, get me Adele's this or get me this. And, and then he'll get it and go, I've got it. I think I've got it. And I go, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. <laughs> oh, no. um, so um, Tracy's quite instrumental. She's brilliant at um, giving me ideas for, mm -hmm. uh, she's a muso. Um, but it's the best bit. It really is. And you get to meet, you know, you get to meet pop stars as well, you know, so, which is fantastic. You were just telling me like a um, half an anecdote, which I didn't quite get the end of about Van Morrison. <laughs> oh yeah, that Van Morrison track at the end, which was all I ever, actually that was a track where I thought that Van Morrison track, I have to have that at the end of the movie mm -hmm. and for the romantic bit. Mm -hmm. And um, we couldn't get the rights to it. We couldn't get the right to it because apparently he couldn't be, he was in a pub, he was on a bender. We could not, we could not get it. and. <laughs> And we just didn't know what to do. And it was just before the movie was about to be released. And I was in the hairdressers getting my hair done for some screening or something or some. And they said, it's just come through. They found him in a pub. <laughs> He's given his permission, oh, you know. Did he um, remember giving his permission? <laughs> I don't know. But anyway, I was so grateful because it just wouldn't have worked without that track. Yeah. You know, it is a great track. And speaking of screenings, this is the same outfit that you were wearing to the premiere 20 years ago. Can you believe I'm, Jack is still fitting into it? Does, it's incredible. It, it doesn't do up at the back. Oh, don't tell me. <laughs> <laughs> but I wore it to the Dublin premiere of, of, oh, um, of Bridget Jones. It's so yeah, beautiful. I know. It doesn't do up at the back. <laughs> <laughs> I love that you brought it back out. Um, you've, you've mentioned Richard Curtis, obviously, Helen, and Andrew Davies was yeah. involved in this as well, who obviously wrote Pride and Prejudice, mm -hmm. who adapted Pride and Prejudice, the series. For you, I know that was two of your great mates that you were working with, but how collaborative was it when you have multiple writers and then you coming with your own vision and your ideas? How how well were you able to sort of collaborate with everybody and make sure that your voice was heard as well? Well, I'm a brilliant collaborator, so... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it's always a bit hellish. And yeah. it's always... A, and it's always... It's like democracy. It's, it's kind of like everybody's ideas and you think, and the best thing to do is think, go away and think, OK, come off your high horse and your mm -hmm. idea and think that idea is actually much better. Right. You know, I'll take it. <laughs> so um, so I think you have to sort of do it that way. But yeah. sometimes, you know, yeah, it can be challenging when everybody's got different ideas. But um, and, and I don't know a movie that hasn't gone through that. I mean, how many movies have you heard where people have left because of creative differences? Yeah. Well, there's always creative differences, but, um, you know, a lot of the time it's it's for the best you know and i really did have some amazing people on that movie and i had richard i had helen very funny people um i had andrew davis you know so i mean i yeah. mean what did andrew davis bring because he's you know such a legend in the world of austin in particular but in period drama that's kind of where yeah. we might know his name from so what kind of elements did he bring to well yeah. he done that pride and prejudice which is the best pride and prejudice it is the still best, yeah. you know colin firth and jennifer ely in the bbc pbs version and he brought that structure and and the book is very is really structured around the pride and prejudice the only the only main thing i can think in the book that changed in the movie was uh, yeah, at the end of the book, there is a, there is a, you know, um, oh, mum has a, a debacle, you know, about holiday lets or something, you know, and um, that was the big conclusion. And Mark Darcy, you know, comes in as a lawyer and saves. And that was the only thing that we really couldn't use because the whole movie had been about a triangle mm. and you had to have a climax that took into account that triangle. And so it was Richard who came up with the idea of what about a fight? Uh, and it took a long time to come up with that idea. Yeah. And um, and we all went, oh yeah, that's what a good idea. Because <laughs> <laughs> then we sort of went middle-class men fighting. Yes. You don't see that, you see it in Westerns, but yeah. you don't, you know, and and then when you think, think that through and work it through, the humor of that, of middle-class men became a sort of big, bitch slapping fest, yeah. you know, rather than, 
haymakers and all of that sort of thing. So it was a really good idea. Choreographing that scene must have been absolutely wild with the window smashing and the kind of movement around. Can you remember like days on set when you were doing that particular oh, I one? Do, I do remember quite vividly the window going through because I just thought, oh, God, we've only got two windows. We've only got two windows <laughs> and we're, we're running so behind because that's all that you do on movies is you think of the budget yeah. and the, the, you know, the schedule mm-hmm. and are you coming in on time? Yeah. And, and you just think, Christ, we're so behind. I hope they get it right. It was, it was stuntmen that went yeah. through the, the window. And, um, and I just watched and I went, fucking hell, I think we got it. Did we get it? Did we get it? It worked. So um, it, was, it was, yeah, that was, that was good. But I think we spent about probably about three nights doing that whole fight in the restaurant all of that it was three nights in borough market and if anybody knows borough market it is just trains noise (laughs) hell it's hell so um but a great a great place full of energy but yeah it's a hard place to film yes um people are like audiences are always kind of really thrilled to hear that a line like their favorite quotes or lines have been ad-libbed by the actors instead of being written by those poor writers who spent like, their lives <laughs> pouring everything into these films. But who was the best at ad-libbing on the day out of your incredible cast of comedic and dramatic actors? I don't know, they're all quite good ad-libbers, but I mean, Hugh prides himself on ad-libbing. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and he really is very good at it. Yeah. So, uh, but um, yeah, I would say that Hugh is probably, you know, a champion ad-libber, yeah. but I mean, Renee ad-libbed a lot, Colin ad-libbed quite a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, in the blue soup scene, Colin had quite oh, yeah. quite a lot. I think he was like given up by then because he was probably so hot with set lights, you know, <laughs> that he was like, oh, you know, we have to keep to the script. You know, so. <laughs> I mean, you, you cast Hugh Grant really against type because until then he'd been been playing like the romantic hero. Yeah. So that was, a, I mean, that was such a brilliant turning point for him in his career as well. He then went on to play the cad yeah. so often and brilliantly. What Was that you? Did you sort of come up with that? I think we all wanted you to do it because I think in part um, Helen had slightly based it a bit on Hugh oh. too. She'd met Hugh through Richard mm-hmm. and, um, and um, you know, she based it on Hugh and somebody else that she knew. But um, so we were all really hoping that he would mm-hmm. do it because it is more like him yeah. than the other roles he's yes. been so. <laughs> Which he said, right? He said it's basically the closest one, I think, to him. So, yeah, it was... Uh, but it, I think he had... He hesitated quite a lot in taking it. Mm-hmm. You know, he we had to, um, you know, do a bit of a dance around him for oh, a bit because okay. I think he was worried about being seen in that way, you know, because Richard had done a, such an amazing job presenting him, as you say, as this mm-hmm. romantic hero, you know, stuttering romantic hero. He did that really well. But um, but I think he's much slightly more, he's just a slightly sexy, sleazy bastard. Yeah, really. I hope he's forever indebted to Not that to he's you. like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, there was, there was the, watching it back, I was, it was so lovely to see like those little cameos from the, um, from the writers. Simon Rushdie and Jeffrey Archer. Can you tell us how that even came about? Was that just, was it Helen calling in favours? Or how did it work? I think it was partly Helen calling in favours, absolutely, because she um, she ran with a literati at the time. <laughs> so um, yeah, there were quite a few in it, but they didn't all make the cut. And I think that's, we can blame Harvey Weinstein. We blame him for everything now, oh, partly because yeah. he's in jail. Yeah. But um, he, uh, I think he said, you know, who are these people? Who are all these? You know, they'd never he'd never heard of Julian Barnes, or, you know, <laughs> um, but he knew Salman Rushdie. Right. You know? So he said Rushdie stays, and the others go. And but, um, okay, um, but anyway, I think we fought a few in there. Yes. There's Sebastian Bokes is in there, uh, yeah. and um, so. But um, it was quite a good moment when he was um, in the cutting room because Harvey Weinstein was. I have to say he did an amazing job at promoting the movie and got it to Oscar recognition and all of that. However, he is a toxic bully. Mm. So um, in the cutting room when he was um, throwing his weight around, at one point he got up and pulled his glasses off and went to look at the screen and said, who's, who's this here? And he pulled his glasses off and put them, threw them on the seat. And then he 
back down again and 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 I thought shall I no I'm not going to tell him and he sat on his glasses and then he wasn't able to see anymore brilliant so. <laughs> so, that is amazing yeah so that was good okay excellent yeah, no. interesting you know we had spoken to loads of yeah, you know, we had spoken that. about loads. Yeah, I don't know. I've got into trouble before when yeah. I. Yeah, you must have someone in your mind. You might have thought, "Oh, she'd be really good if she doesn't take it." That type of thing. Yeah, Generally. I mean, no, we'd spoken about so many. Yeah. Um and um, I, no, I can tell you now. Who cares? Um, but it was like that. We'd spoken about Kate Winslet. Yeah. We'd spoken about. I can't quite remember. Or, you know, all of the amazing actresses we spoke yeah. about, and it and it and it just came down to at the time Renee came to meet. And she was, she came over to me off her own bat, you know, from America. She said, I want to meet for it. And, yeah. um, and so obviously we were flattered by that. So, and, yeah. and I had loved her in um, Jerry Maguire and I'd loved her in Nurse Betty. I'd seen an early screening of Nurse yeah. Betty, which not many people know, but um, I thought, oh, I love this, this actor. So if she can half do an English accent, it's, I will take her in a heartbeat. So. So yeah, there was loads of people were discussed, and it, it was difficult making a choice to take an American, yeah. you know, when there are so many brilliant English actors too. Well, it took 12, 12 weeks to film, um, which you don't get anymore in movies. That's okay. that's considered quite a long time these days. But um, um, and the snow, no, it was all fake snow, and it was hell. <laughs> hell. And it was my idea, unfortunately, because I thought it should be framed, you know, uh, in at Christmas to Christmas, and there should yeah. be snow, and it should have a fairy tale element. Because filming in London is quite difficult a lot of the time because it looks grey and leaden skies, and you think, okay, how can we take it to a sort of um, fairy tale uh, way of doing it? And and so I thought snow, and then I lived to regret it <laughs> because it takes so much time and then there are 20 different types of snow there is paper snow and there is foam snow and there is and it's always bloody melting and you can't get the con continuity right and the actors had it in their eyes and their you know so uh, there were lots of complaints about the snow but i think it was worth it, it looks although. really good which one did you go for out of all the different snows oh no we had them all they you were had all, all going at once they, <laughs> because I don't know if there's anybody here that does snow. They take it very seriously. And and I'd say, no, that snow looks fine. And they'd say, no, you can't have that snow in the air. There's, you know, that's not the type of snow you'd have in the air. You know, so it's, um, yeah, they, they take it very seriously. I've just done a, I did another movie in 2020 for Disney where they said, we loved your snow work in Bridget Jones <laughs> and we want this to be a snow movie. And I just, oh, Great. Let's, do more, let's do more snow. The, the, the flat Rennie's is it's in too. Borough Market and it is a real building. It's yeah. on the top of the Globe pub. Ah, okay. And okay. when we first started filming, there was a railway line that runs through one window. Well, at the time we got to Bridget Jones Baby, there was a railway around the other side. Mm -hmm. So there's two railway lines. So I felt that even though Borough Market had be has become quite shishi now, I thought, when we, by the time we got to Bridget's baby, because it's got two railway lines running either side of it, she could have afforded to buy it, you know, by then. There, there is, I, you know, there it could well be. I think there's a lot of enthusiasm uh, from Helen and from Universal to make uh, the fourth film, which is based on Mad About the Boy, which is Helen's novel, the later, the latest novel. Mm -hmm. um, um, but and so I'm, I think, you know, I, I think it will happen. It's just a matter of when. Yeah. That is such a good question, and I don't know because I probably, a bit like Bridget, inside I was panicking, 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 and outwardly I was, you know, um, not panicking or you know carrying it off. But what would be the a, a good piece of advice? Um, do you know what? I think I think I know. I would listen more. I would listen to everyone more, even if I didn't go with any of their decisions. <laughs> I would, I would, I would listen more. You know, and I think I think at the time I I thought sometimes I felt that 
look, I haven't done this before. I've only got one set of ideas, you know, so I, they have to happen because I don't know how to come up with another set, you know, of how to do this. And things in movies are constantly changing because you'll, you'll say, oh, I see it at this location and shot this way. And nine times out of 10, they'll go, actually, the night before, you can't have that location and you can't shoot it that way and we haven't got the money and you haven't got the time. And so you really do have to think on your feet again. And, and I think the important thing is to, to listen to everybody's advice rather than thinking, crap, I don't know what to do if, they, if it doesn't go that way. Yeah. You know, so I, I think I would listen more. I suppose I wasn't new to the whole idea of filming. I'd shot uh, documentaries and commercials. But I was surrounded by great people. You know, I was surrounded by great actors. I was surrounded by great producers. So it wasn't, you know, I, I always knew that there was sort of help at hand. Um, but I don't know, I, I, the working with the actors is, is fantastic. And working with those actors was fantastic. So I, I get always very excited by learning all the time from them. And, and being, having the confidence to say, let's try it a different way. And Renee is brilliant at doing choices. She will say, she will always say, let's do it this way, but let's definitely do it this way, and let's do it this way. And because she led the way in that respect, and she's American, and we think that they are much better at method acting than <laughs> we are. You know, I thought, yeah, let's do it like that. Let's choices, let's all do choices. And, and that, was, that was a great learning curve for me. And so I, I felt the confidence to say to all the actors, let's try it a different way. And let's, you know, and, and, and you need those choices in the edit suite because you need the, when you get to the edit suite, you might want to take the movie in this direction or in the emotional direction or in a high direction then. And you need all those choices. So you go, let's take the one where it's a bit neutral or let's take the one where she's really hysterical or let's, you know, so it, it, was, it was a really good learning curve and something I've taken with me to other movies as well. It's interesting you should say that because I look at it now and I kind of think, oh, crikey, I don't think I planned it that way at all. <laughs> so it was interesting. We had a really fantastic um, cinematographer called Stuart Dryberg, who'd, who the movie before he was the piano. So and I just thought, OK, this isn't going to be like the piano, yeah. but wow. I'll, I'll have him. And, you know, so um, so I think it was, you know, Every, a lot of things were storyboarded, and because um, because I was a first-time director, I think everybody felt safer if we storyboarded everything. But uh, amazingly enough, I mean, the the first cut of the movie, however, was three and a half hours long. We had tons of it, and so I had to get that down to ninety minutes, which was the best thing we could have done because three and a half hours of comedy, you're just not laughing anymore. <laughs> so to try and cut it down, so all of those storyboarded ideas pretty much went out the window. And um, one thing that did go out the, the window was kind of gorgeous, you know, images of London. You know, beauty shots of London don't make it in a comedy. I've learned that now. I always try for it. You know, go look at that shot, and it's the first thing that goes. So, you know, it's it's interesting because, as I say, the, what what was in my head for it and what it what was storyboard, it's not like that. So I'm glad it worked. Really, you're cutting for the, ref, you're cutting for laughs and for the pace of laughs. And you, for a comedy, you take it through lots of screenings, um, and you work out from those screenings when are they laughing, why are they laughing, you know, and then you cut it accordingly which sounds like sacrilege, but it's, you know, you need to make it go fast and you need to make it funny and you need the pacing of the humour to work. And so all of your visual ideas go out the window. So <laughs> I'm really glad that you think that. So. My, I mean, my favourite is probably a little bit contentious, which is, is skirt off sick? <laughs> <laughs> that makes me cackle every time.